So if you will say and spell your name as a test. Uh, Nikki Hamblin. N I K K I N I K K I. Welcome to Beat About Interviews. This is Jesse A.M. I am joined with Nikki Hamblin. Uh, you may know her from Joy Bank or as the owner and curator of Project Studio and Gallery. Hey. Hey, Jesse. Hey. How are you? <laughs> I love you. I love you, That's too. how I am. I know. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> so let, let's talk about what Projects is because if people haven't tuned in or they weren't in any of the shows, you know, they may have missed out in a season or two because you've been living in Asheville. You're just now coming back. So tell us. What is Projects? Projects is uh, basically, <laughs> for the community, it is a space for queer, trans, freak, fringe, outsider, underground, hide in your garage, no one knows you're an artist, or you are loud and proud and you're not graduating from college. <laughs> you're not uh, a landscape artist who's retiring. You don't do pottery. But what if you were? <laughs> you're a working, somewhat punk ass, <laughs> radical in some way. And your art probably would maybe not really sit well in a living room over a couch. True. I have people in who North want to Johnson over. City. In North Johnson City. <laughs> now we're bringing it down to a specific sect. But yeah. This was like a motion. It was kind of like a family when you were at a project. So yeah. that makes a lot of sense. And you've been here in different iterations. Can you tell us about the evolution of it over time? Yes. Um, projects was something that I knew that I had to do when I moved back from Portland. Oregon in uh, 2009 and I knew that I wanted to have my own gallery for several years before that and I wasn't sure how to do it and I kept looking at it from a normal sort of path like a right wing sort of business oriented path and was like wow I'll never do that and a couple of years before I moved to Portland I just decided that it really didn't need to be that and I didn't want to do that. I didn't think that we needed more of that. Um, and Johnson City has such a rich underground. It's full of very <laughs> unsuspecting geniuses. I mean, I specifically remember the last show you had when we were on West Walnut. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was literally a day crowded with Little bands you've never heard of, people playing in this room, art hanging in that room. Of course, there was a party going on, but you know, it was just everyone. And then it just moved right to the Mecca. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so it was somewhere where everybody kind of came out. Yes. When you didn't have a place of your own, too, you just you came to projects. Yeah. And it, projects started out as a formal sort of storefront gallery. Um, when I moved back here in 2009, I was lucky enough to have a foothold um, in the art community here already um, from throwing punk shows and art shows and borrowed spaces for years and even back to 1999 when I you know started with a couple of other artists here um, the Johnson City Contemporary Artist Co-op and we acquired a studio uh, several of us did um, we were given a paid show at Tuscan Gallery, which was the only paid show to ever be outside the Greenville Arts Council. Um, and we, we made several feats in a very conservative community as a radical uh, contemporary art you know, group. We, uh, we acquired a studio on, um, at the old BG Garland building. Uh, Which one is that? By the, by the down home, it burned down a few years ago in a blaze of glory. It had been sort of the Chelsea Hotel of Johnson City for a long time. Lots and lots of wonderful 
talented, insane musicians, artists of all kinds lived in that building. And um, it's no longer there. It's just a patch of grass right across from Carver Park. That's so sad. Right. It is very sad. <laughs> um, and I had an apartment there and moved to a house in Highland, and I felt like we needed a formal space, and so I donated it as a studio space, and we all started to chip in on the rent. Um, I have a very good friend, Blaine Willis, who most of all, all of us really served well from the space, but Blaine Willis, most of all, I think, really found himself in that space, and he's an incredible artist that you can check out on Facebook, Blaine Willis Art on Facebook really just wow like how far he's come from the first paintings I saw to the first paintings that he painted in the apartment and he's held on to that style and that spirit this whole time and just evolved as a really amazing kind of classic you know fine artist but also very much self-taught um, musician as well vaudeville artist Someone that we're lucky to have back in our community. Um, yeah, so that's an artist plug from someone who had, I've seen grow from that time in 1999 when he was a drummer for this band called The Invisibles that basically rocked everyone's socks off here and made JC a really fun, almost comic book kind of rock and roll town. And when they died, that that sort of fun, colorful comic book vibe sort of died in JC. And with the band Joy Bang, that is Brooklyn Bang and myself and many other characters that float in and out from the Johnson City music scene, I really wanted to bring that sort of fun back into the music scene here. So that was the first iteration of Projects, correct? And that yeah. was the one that, that came down on Tipton Street for a while. Yeah, years later, I moved back here, and um, I came back into town to open a restaurant, help out with that project, but my creative spirit was, you know, it's always doing something else on the side. And um, I just, I'd known since I was a small child that I wanted to own an art gallery. And I, how does a kid in Caswell, Tennessee, who has never even been in an art gallery I don't even see those on television but I know what that is <laughs> you know how do you, how do you decide that well it, it seems like you make the decision but then to do it you have to you have to break the rules of what typically works right I had to plow through a lot of conditioning and um, sheltered uh, childhood to get back to that dream. Because at six years old, I had the dream. And then for a long time, I just, it was covered up. And when I found Johnson City, <laughs> this small, strange town, you know, right next to Asheville, on the Nolichucky River, Buffalo Mountain, you know, this geographical kind of hotspot. You know, ETSU, Milligan, and there's all this tension of like the academic and the radical and the underground, and it's really a wonderful recipe for and a secret artistic haven, you know, kind of like Asheville 15 years ago, when, when it was all like small time, you know. You would go to a coffee shop and you would be in an open mic and then someone would ask you to play at an art opening and then you would get hooked in with all these people and you know it was just this community that organically grew it wasn't oh this bar is so chic and <laughs> you know come here. come here you know and we make handcrafted cocktails and blah 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 it's it's full of these people who are just being raw and expressing themselves from kind of a uh, just a very ground level, grassroots, you know, but also evolved because they live in a small town and they deal with the expectations, the pressures, the restraint of a small Appalachian community. And it kind of refines them in a certain way. It refines all of us artists who live here. Yeah, well, you always want to be able to have that that exposure, you know, be, putting your art out is one of the most important things in the world. 
your urge doesn't have to be great. It has to be. It just has to be. It right. just has to be. And so being able to share that and you know move through these communities uh, is a really important part of that. Can you remember what, what might be your most... What, what do you most enjoy? What's a memory that sticks out to you? Hmm. Uh, I probably have two or three. Okay. Because well, it's been a it's been a, a been long a long, ride. a long ride with Johnson City and art and music and projects and everything before that. So what are your top three in no particular order? Um wow. Okay. So I think I probably have three. Yes. Top three is good. The first would be watching again, watching Blaine Willis create his first triptych painting which was his really really his first painting in the project in in the studio the original johnson city contemporary arts co-op studio in 2000 uh, he just transformed and was sort of possessed and created this triptych on the wall that was his first painting that started the phase the period of growth that he is in now still and he's kept with that style so much and just perfected it and expanded upon it because it's an extension of itself right uh, so but he found it in that in that that three room shotgun apartment that many you know heroin junkies and alcoholics and artists and freaks and dreamers have lived in for years you know and number i'm not going to say that this is number one this is number two this is number three best you know whatever but another would probably be uh this would be 2009 i came back to town from portland oregon and i just felt the need to i'd always been a performing artist in the sense of playing a little music being a part of a feminist performance group, doing performance art, spoken word, all these things, but I wanted to do something more theatrical, but radical and sort of interrupting. And um, for JC, it would be very shocking. <laughs> so um, I've been a part of First Fridays for years in this town. And when I came back in 2009, I was very interested in doing some sort of vaudeville, burlesque flash mob thing I had dabbled in burlesque before I moved to Portland um, we uh, several of us artists got together and did an All Hallows Eve burlesque review um, some really talented talented people who've gone on to do theater in major cities and things like that we did that back in 2006 so when I came back in 2009 I wanted to do that but I wanted to do it in a more spontaneous way so we thought vaudeville a little pop culture cultish culture and flash mobs mixed it all together and this also coincided with the opening of the first projects gallery on tipton street it was at 122 tipton street beside label and tipton street pub um and Brad Ward and myself and Darith Padilla, who's an amazing graffiti artist slash painter, visionary um, around town. Uh, the three of us decided to, I well, we wanted to do projects. I was given a space by uh, URA, which is Urban Renewal Alliance, um, for $100 a month because they knew what I had done in the community for years before and they were like, you want an art space? We have spaces. And we know what you do. And we'll give it to you for $100 a month, even even though it rents for $1,100 a month. You want spaces? We got spaces. Yeah. We want, we give you space. That's so nice. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was very... I was so appreciative and honored to be able to find some sort of, you know, honestly conservative, yuppie... <laughs> Uh, you know broker organization that was willing to believe in me and all my freak friends <laughs> so, so that's that's one two of three yeah well the, the moment the moment that I'm describing though I got off track and then led back into the old projects and so 
the thing that sort of brought on even getting the space downtown was uh, me deciding that I wanted to have a group here called the, Vaud- the JC Vaudevillains. And I decided to just put out a flyer for people who were interested in performing. We had a meeting next door at the coffee house when it still looked like a meat packing room. And um, we talked about, you know, visions and ideas and all these things. And we decided on a flash mob of Skid Row or the downtown song from Little Shop of Horrors. Oh my God. And it was myself and Brad Ward, Kara Sixon, and John Chambers and Matt Volrath, all from the Penny Dreadfuls. Um, a couple of old school, you know, people around town, David Basinger, this guy Larry, who's an incredible folk bluegrass musician, um, Allison Mullins, who's, you know, massage therapist, priestess extraordinaire, also an amazing blues singer, a couple of other people, and we started on a first Friday, we decided to do this. We practiced in the down home. We received uh, improv lessons from this really wonderful lady who's been working at the down home for years and who's a wonderful actress. Um, and we worked for months and months just to make this one little flash mob happen. We went on a first Friday. We you know, advertised it to some people. We got some people in on it. We started at Nelson Gallery and you know, started the song there and then just sort of like, picked up players and singers and musicians in the song all the way down Main Street and uh, ended in front of Newman's in a circle with like the main characters in the middle and sang the song perfectly and you know there was just there were just a ton of people from Newman's and walking down the street and First Friday people and gallery people a huge mix of people just cheering at the end and we you know we pulled that off it's really hard to pull something like that off in a small town and get people to understand what it is and prompt them to respond in the, the not the correct way, but just to receive it in the right way. Right. Especially with that. With in a positive way in a town like this. It's nearly impossible. Right. But we did, and it was very well received, and... It was pretty flawless. So that was another moment where this Dadaist, but very grounded sort of, you know, philosophy was put into work for all of these artists who work in different ways. But we were like, okay, this has got to be, this has to be solid, but also spontaneous. And only with that mix of people can we make that happen. (laughs) Hard, but. Um, I have to give, give a lot of credit to Dustin Gingro. Uh, he is in, uh, just for current reference, he is in a band called Autark, and he's also part of Skeleton Pecker. Um, a guy that I've known since 1999. Old friend, a community, you know, friend and creative. We haven't really collaborated very much, but we've always sort of been, you know, doing things and active in the community at the same time. Um, I was booking punk shows, as I stated before, at the space next door to the Acoustic Coffee House in 2004 to 2006. Now, you were talking about a pallet stage earlier before right. on the show. Can you describe <laughs> to everyone what this place would look like? Okay. When you... Basically, the history of the Acoustic Coffee House is that before it was the coffee house, it and the space next door, which is called the next door, was uh, the storefront space, which was the coffee house, was a uh, butcher shop where you purchased meat that was cut, that was prepared, cut, packaged, and everything next door. And the next door was a storage locker cooler for. The butcher shop next door. So there were large carcasses of meat of all sorts hanging in this huge room that was basically a cooler. And after that, it had been a dry cleaning spot, a dry cleaners. So (laughs) you have this concrete room that has a hint of carcasses and things like that, that later became a dry cleaning place so there was a facade placed into the front of the building. 
the facade was nice and wooden and just homey, but then the back was just industrial, you know, it had hints of just something very primal happening in the back. <laughs> and when I was throwing punk shows in there, uh, the front was wooded and nice and you walked through the doorway and it was just this, you know, cinder blocked place that had these, you know, rails over the top where the thing, where the carcasses were hung and the meat was hung and stored and so it had a very raw feeling. Uh, nothing like it has today. No, not at all. They have changed that place so dramatically. Right. And the changes uh, have basically been brought on by the interior structure changing and the wood from those walls that are on those walls that are placed so symmetrically and it makes all these diamond shapes, you know, it's really beautiful all the way around. All of that wood used to sit in the middle of the space. So I had a bunch of punk shows in there for like six months and then all of a sudden Jim said, Jim and Alicia said, we're gonna cover this room in wood. It's gonna look really beautiful. We're gonna change the feeling and the sound. And But he had to have a place to store the wood. So he stored the wood in there and I was doing the shows over there and Dustin Gingro messaged me and said, I really think that Ian McKay, like we should try to get Ian McKay to come up here of Fugazi slash the Evens. And of course I was very supportive and I was like, I will, I'll make that happen. I'll make the space happen, you know, and he, he was tenacious enough. <laughs> to convince Ian McKay to come to Johnson City with his wife, Amy, and perform as the Evens in that space. And we had to move every single piece of wood that you now see on those walls. That was laying in the middle of the floor. So as a community who was dedicated to quality underground music had to come there one night and move all of those pieces of two by two, you know, pieces of wood out into a trailer in the back just so we could make a stage made of pallets and mylar for Ian the Kai and his wife to play on as the Evens. So that was pretty cool. It is, and is that why you do it? <laughs> Tell us about what motivates you to do these sort of things. Um, I mean, I think that the idea of just working until we're 65 is pretty horrible. So I'm just trying to offset that for myself and a lot of my friends and people that I believe in and or believe in me and believe in creative magic and how creative magic can make the doldrums of everyday life so much better. Um, and so that we're all keeping on our toes and we're awake, you know? So that we're not sucked in completely. That's really, that's really my motivation. And from, you know, 15 years ago when I started doing art of any kind, but projects in particular, it's just a, I needed some sort of, almost a mantra, you know, as far as the name goes for this, this project of mine that I'm doing. It's my ongoing art project, but it's made up of mine and all of these wonderful, beautiful, chaotic, and established or not established and dedicated artists and their little projects that they have in mind inside of this big project. And so there's really only one thing I could call it at that point. It was just a very neutral, you know, it's like providing a power strip, <laughs> you know, for all of the other like chords of electric electricity and creativity and you know activity 
you know, I don't, I don't care what it is, but if you're undiscovered, or if you're famous in Europe but not in America, like that's fine. <laughs> you know, we want you to, we want you to plug in here. And we make a special home for underground, industrial, you know, comic book, fringe, queer, trans, you know, all across the spectrum, artists. That description of it as a power strip is probably the best thing I, I've heard of it described. <laughs> and it really is. It's where, it's where you come to be plugged in. Too. Yeah. Um, so what kind of visions do you have for this new space that you have going in? You know, you'll have your, your next show fairly soon. We don't have a date on it, but uh, who is the artist for that show? Um, his name's Jim, and that's all I'm going to say right now. Okay. Um, I don't want to give too much away because you because people will look him up, and you know, I just kind of want to keep everything sort of quiet. Now, this is this, going to be an art show. Yes. This this phase of this third phase, it's kind of like it's sort of the fourth phase, but it's the third phase officially. Um, is more of a home project that has public space uh, every now and again. Right. We're going to build it slowly over the winter months, and then in the spring and the summer, we're going to have lots more activity. Um, the difference with that being from the last time is that the last time that we had a house venue, or I had a house venue, I threw a show before I even moved my furniture in. And so therefore the house was solidified as a public art space and secondarily my home and practice space. This space is first my home and Brooklyn Bang's home and Adam Wyatt's home and a couple of other choice people who may be moving in. It's our home and our creative space privately and then, and then secondly, we're kind of ruminating this series of shows that will sort of kick off in the winter and then go through the summer and fall next year. Um, it's home space first. And, and I've always been interested in spaces that have that fluidity. Living on the West Coast, I saw a lot of venues that were house spaces and people just gave up their living rooms for the sake of art. And that's what I wanted to do with my last house and it was perfect and great the way it was. I didn't have a couch in my living room, you know. I It was art space and there was usually lots of dirt on the floor from the last show and maybe some beer and glitter and tinsel and whatever and then lots of art on the walls but I didn't really care about that. This time I have to... I. I'm catering to my my friends and close family who are more domestic than my, than myself, um, and so I'm creating a domestic space that is supplementally and secondarily for the community as an art space. Yeah, in fact, we're recording this entire episode at the project space right now, and you might hear in the background the dulcet tones of, of Brooklyn Bang, Brooklyn Info, and uh, and some people. Some secret Joy Bang drummers. New Joy Bang member, maybe? Maybe. Who knows? We'll find out about that another time, won't we? Yeah. But uh, it, it's a great space. It has a great energy to it. Thank and you. when these shows do kick off, where is everybody going to be looking to find out the information on them? You have a Facebook page, right? Yeah, we have a Facebook page. Um, and it's Project Studio and Gallery. It's been going since uh, 2000. 2010 and uh, you can see all the phases of projects on there we are doing social media very sparingly lately and when we start to really rev it up you'll know that something's really about to happen soon um, and also on Instagram at insta joy bang uh, through through my band joy bang with Brooklyn bang and several other community members I also uh, often tag things as Project's House lately because Joy Bang is happening inside of Project's House and many other bands are and I like to you know include include that in that page so that will that page will sort of be the voice for Project's and the band itself. And with that said, um, moving on, you have a couple of days coming up for Joy Bang, don't you? Yeah, well we have, we are sort of on a break right now. We're playing with some other artists and seeing uh, what some possibilities are with different arrangements. Um, but our our next show is uh, October 30th, 
It's a femme folk night that Kara Sixon from the Penny Dreadfuls and also her project, Karis Carter. She's been putting this show on. This is the second one. Uh, so it's Amethyst Kaya, um, Chelsea Kinzer, um, and uh, Kara Sixon, and Joy Bay. Um, at Brick House Music in Jonesboro, which is a cozy little new music spot, I guess, in Jonesboro on Main Street. We'll have some kegs from Depot Street Brewery, and there'll be it's a costume night. It's the night before Halloween. It's something kind of off the grid to do, and that's our next show. And we've been offered a lot of shows lately in Asheville and Knoxville and JC, but we're kind of we're sort of trying to just gestate right now and write some new stuff and see what we can, who we can integrate into our project, and then bring that out later. All right, thank you so much, Nikki, for being our guest tonight. Uh, come see us at the October 30th show. It's downtown Bristol at 712 West State, Oman's Pub and Grill. This is Jesse A.M. and Nikki Nikki. Nikki Nikki. Not just Nikki, but Nikki Nikki. And we'll see you next time.